We are in Hosea chapter 10 and 11 tonight. Encourage you to have your Bibles getting open to that if they're not there already. And um, as you turn, we'll just pray one more time. Father, we do thank you for your word, and I pray that you would teach us tonight. Thank you, Lord, for uh, not just the picture of judgment, but the picture of grace, the picture of love, the picture of mercy that's here. And so, Father, help us follow after Jesus. Help us um, see you for what you've done for us, see you for who you are, and glorify you as such. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We call it sometimes the law of unintended consequences. And that's, you know, when what happens as a result of one action was totally unforeseen when another action was taken. And sometimes this can be for good things. Um, you know, uh, they've discovered that when ships get sunk off of uh, shallow waters, a lot of times that creates uh, a coastal reef, which is good for the ocean and the environment, and that sort of thing. So that's, that's a good thing. Other th- times it can be bad things. If you've ever driven through the southeastern U.S., I have a lot of family in that area. You see the kudzu plant that's completely taken over down there. They brought it in to do one thing, and it just ran rampant and, and choked out a lot of the natural a plant life that was there. Unintended consequence. Um, of course, you see it also in times of modern warfare. Sometimes things happen, one action is taken with very tragic consequences. Does it always mean that you know things were unavoidable? It just means that things were unforeseen. Sometimes if you do a little more research, a little bit more planning, and in the case of you know a lot of political things happening in Congress, a little bit more openness, um, then some of these things would be uncovered people would just, if they would heed the advice that was given to them, consequences, some consequences could be avoided altogether. All right, I say all that to say this, because that was the case with Israel. They were in the middle of receiving a slew of unintended consequences as a result of their years of idolatry and rebellion against God. Now, chronologically speaking, we know that it hasn't quite come yet. They were at the tail end of their history as an independent kingdom, on the verge of being conquered, on the verge of being assimilated by the much greater Assyrian, the vast Assyrian Empire. And of course, according to God, uh, he showed that it was their actions that had brought them to this point. This was their consequence. Unintended, though, as it would have been. But again, it could have been avoidable if the northern kingdom had just listened to God, if they'd humbled themselves in repentance, if they knew God in true worship and fear, then they would have experienced something totally different. Wasn't to be. Like us, they doubled down on stubbornness and stupidity, charged headlong to the very place they wanted to be, which was slavery. That was the simple consequences of their actions. They had reaped what they had sown. Now that said, And it'd be easy to forget this, especially with all the books that seem to talk so much about the judgment of God. Don't think for a moment that this did not grieve the heart of God. It did. He loved his people. And the very last thing he wanted for them was slavery and death. They brought this upon themselves, but he wanted so much more for them. He wanted them to know him in spirit and truth, to worship him in sincerity, to live in a right relationship with him. And of course, he wants that same thing from us. The issue, though, comes down to a matter of choice. Are we going to listen to ourselves or are we going to listen to God? If we choose to ignore God, we ignore his word and we, you know, launch headstrong into our own preferences, we're going to expect to experience all of the consequences that come with that, whether we foresee them or not. How much better it is when we make the choice to listen to our Lord God. He loves us. We can trust his will for us. All right? So that's what we want to look at today. Hosea chapter 10 is the consequences, okay? It starts off with them going from prosperity to poison, starting in verse one. Israel empties his vine, he brings forth fruit for himself. According to the multitude of his fruit, he has increased the altars. According to the bounty of his land, they have embellished his sacred pillars. There is an alternate translation of verse one. If you're following on a New American Standard or English Standard, you see this. Israel is a luxuriant vine. The Hebrew word that's actually used there is a homonym with lots of Uh, definitions, context being the key to translation. If you look at the ancient Greek and Latin versions and translations of this Hebrew text, they render it according to luxury, luxuriousness, lushness, fruitfulness. That being said, what we see here in the King James, New King James, it still does work. After all, a fruit uh, must first be fruitful, or a vine must first be fruitful if it is to be emptied. 
See, the whole idea here is one of prosperity. That There was a time that the northern kingdom of Israel, as rebellious as it was, was doing quite well for itself. Yes, they were in sin against God, but they were still prosperous. They still had their share of political problems or a lot of assassinations taking place there, if you look at the history. But they still experienced some times of economic and military boom, wealth, all sorts of things. But please note, that does not mean that they were blessed or favored by God. Quite the opposite. Hosea is in the middle of pronouncing God's judgment against them. One thing this says for us is that we need to get past the idea of thinking that blessing is tied with wealth. That God's favor is given to us just because things are going well. We have a tendency to tie too much together with relative peace or material prosperity. When things are going great for our nation, for the USA, economic times are good. We think of ourselves as blessed. When, when we struggle, we say, oh, God's judgment is coming. Let me suggest that's the wrong standard. We're not uh, to consider ourselves uh, blessed by our prosperity, but the standard is, how are we in Christ? Not temporary circumstances, how are we in Jesus? You know, if Paul judged his standing with the Lord Jesus by his circumstances, he might have thought himself easily to have been punished because his life was in constant danger. He lived in poverty. His message was rejected by untold numbers of Jews and Gentiles. You would think this guy is a failure, but absolutely not. Paul considered himself blessed. And even when Jesus specifically told him he was going to allow him to suffer in some ways, Paul still considered himself blessed. You might remember from 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, uh, talking about this thorn that God said he would not remove from him. And he, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And all those things that all the world would say, oh, you're not being blessed. You're experiencing God's discipline when you're infirmities, when you're reproached. And Paul says, I'm blessed. For Christ's sake, I can boast in that. Because that's when Jesus is made strong. For Paul, the sign of blessing wasn't whether or not his circumstances were good or bad, but whether or not he was in Christ. As long as Jesus was being magnified through him, that was enough. Likewise for us. So, guys, we need to stop looking at American political trends, economic indicators, our personal health records, our checkbooks, bank accounts, to see whether or not we're being blessed by God. We need to look to Christ, ensuring that we're walking with him in the power of the Spirit. If we're doing that, we are blessed. So, how could Israel know that Israel was not blessed in the midst of her prosperity? Well, just look what she did with her wealth. Israel increased the altars of false gods, erected sacred pillars for idols. So instead of going to Jerusalem to the one altar of God that was acceptable, Israel forsook the true God to go after the false. So her wealth did her no good. Verse 2, their heart is divided. Now they are held guilty. He will break down their altars. He will ruin the sacred pillars. So the time now had come for judgment. The heart of Israel was divided, false, faithless, devious, deceitful, depending on which translation you're reading. Right? All of those things apply. Again, this is another homonym. could be translated any number of ways. But contextually, any number of those ways, all those ways are good. They're appropriate. All of them signify a heart that is turned away from the Lord God, either being unable or unwilling to worship him alone in truth. And so thus, God would act. All these altars they had multiplied, all these pillars they had built would be brought to nothing. God would ensure their destruction as judgment came upon the nation. Understand this. God does not share worship space. God does not take second place to anyone or anything. He is either worshipped alone by us or he's not at all. Now, at this particular point in Israel's history, they were trying a little bit of you know, worship by buffet, thinking they can just pick and choose on the line what they wanted to worship when they wanted to worship it. And sometimes it was the Baals. Sometimes it was at least them paying lip service to God. That's not the way true worship works. In real worship, we worship and recognize God as God. There's a reason that the Ten Commandments begins with God's declaration that he is the Lord and that Israel should have no other gods before him. Exodus 2, 2 and, or 20, verse 2 and 3. Because there are no other gods but him. Isaiah 45. God will not compete for attention. And this is one reason why it's such a problem when we engage in idolatry of our own. When we erect false ideas of God in our minds, when we worship our jobs, our families, or our hobbies, we put that on the same level as God. 
Guys, that's not giving God second place. That's not giving him any place. Because Jesus said no one can serve two masters. So we either worship God alone or we're not worshiping him at all. That's what Israel did. They despised God in their worship. They despised the covenant they had made with him, as he says in verse 3. For now, they say, we have no king because we did not fear the Lord. And as for a king, what would he do for us? They have spoken words, swearing falsely and making a covenant. Thus, judgment springs up like hemlock in the furrows of the field. Now, at the time of Hosea's prophecy, they did, of course, have a king. But they wouldn't have one for long. That's the point. Soon Assyria would come in, take the nation into slavery, and the Israelites would experience all of the consequences that came with disobeying the covenant they had originally made with God, which, by the way, God in the covenant he made with them said this is exactly what would happen. They didn't fear God and worship. They didn't obey a godly king in the rare times that they had one, and they rejected their previous covenant commitment. And their faithlessness to God produced one thing, poison. They sowed the poison of their sin into the ground and poisonous weeds, hemlock. One of the philosophers ate hemlock to die. Sprung up all around them in the form of national judgment. We know the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. This is something they learned firsthand. And so they see the futility of their idolatry starting here in verse 5. The inhabitants of Samaria fear because of the calf of beth Avon. For its people mourn for it, its priests shriek for it, because its glory has departed from it. The idol also shall be carried to Assyria as a present for King Jerob. Ephraim shall receive shame, and Israel shall be ashamed of his own counsel. Just a couple of reminders for identification in case you weren't with us last time. Beth-Avon is uh, really a, a derogatory name for Beth-El. Beth-Avon means house of idolatry. Beth-El means house of God. And we saw this earlier in chapter 4, verse 15, chapter 5, verse 8. King Jerob, uh, there's no King Jerob in Israel's history. This is most likely a reference to the king of Assyria. If you translate Jerob from, transliterate that actually from Assyrian, it would be the great one, so the great king. So the king of Assyria doing this. You see this in chapter 5, verse 13. But the idea here is that the famous idols of Jeroboam, those golden calves that he made, one of which, by the way, was set up in Bethel, which is why they called it now beth Avon, house of idolatry. All those idols had failed Israel. Those idols, those statues, were even going to be taken captive along with the nation. And remember, just like when the real glory of God would soon depart from the real temple of God in Jerusalem, we read about that in Ezekiel chapter 10. Well, so did the false glory of this false idol depart from the people. And this is shown to be ineffective and void. This false god did not protect the northern kingdom from being conquered. It was useless. And so what did Israel receive as a result? They received shame. Idols always lead to shame. Anything we worship other than the true God is always going to disappoint us. We worship pleasures, but pleasures are fleeting. We worship wealth, but wealth is empty and unfulfilling. I've never met a person that had a lot of money that said, well, I don't need to make any more money. They always want more. We worship self, and self ends up being an illusion. All of it brings shame. And even if you lie to yourself in the present and say, well, I do get fulfillment from this, then it's going to be impossible to lie to yourself at the final judgment. Because what idol can truly be fulfilling to us when we're looking God face to face? The only one worthy of our worship is Almighty God. And only when we worship Him do we find that we're not put to shame. He's the only one who gives real peace, lasting joy, eternal salvation. There is no shame in the name of Jesus. But that is, of course, what they had turned away from, and that's why they're experiencing these consequences. Verse 7, As for Samaria, her king is cut off like a twig on the water. Also the high places of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall grow on their altars. They shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills fall on us. So everybody in Israel is judged. Israel's king, Samaria's king, cut off, destroyed, like a twig floating on the river, just out there, wasted. The idolatrous places in Israel will be destroyed. Desolation and waste comes on the land. God's judgment upon his people. All these things happen because they had rejected him. Now, the things spoken of regarding the northern kingdom in that day that they were conquered by Assyria those very things are going to be repeated later on by those who endure the great tribulation to come. Jesus specifically quotes Hosea here uh, when he's talking to the women as he's making that torturous uh, trek on the Via Dolorosa going to the cross. Uh, we'll read this. 
much later when we get there in chapter 23, and Luke's going to take us a while to get there, but Luke 23, 28 through 30 says, But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For indeed the days are coming in which they will say, Blessed are the barren wombs that never bore, breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills cover us. Jesus says, as bad as this day is that I'm going to the cross, you haven't seen anything until the judgment of God falls here upon Jerusalem. The people who live to see the day of God's wrath will want to shelter even in rock slides and avalanches because it's going to be too horrible to face anything else. And John actually seems to write the fulfillment of those days at the very beginning, the opening days of the Great Tribulation as the sixth seal is open. We read this in Revelation 6, 15 through 16, and the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commander, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, they hid themselves in the caves and the rocks and the mountains, said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? You say, well, what makes rocks so preferable to God's wrath? Well, it's God, that's why, because it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10, 31. When a person comes to grip with the fact that every single thought, deed, and action will be measured next to the infinite perfection of the righteous God, if we think about that rationally, that ought to send a shiver and a tremor up our spine. Because without help, without covering, everyone is doomed. But because of Christ, we're not. No one has to face the judgment of God. This is exactly what Jesus saves us from. He gives us his help. He covers us with his righteousness. So for a born-again Christian, the thought of seeing our Lord is not terrifying. It's tremendous. We've received the grace of Jesus, so we don't have to run to the hills. We just run to him. They didn't know that, and so that's why they're running from God. So it's talking next about Israel to be bound up in slavery and sin. Verse 9, O Israel, you have sinned from the days of Gibeah. There they stood. The battle in Gibeah against the children of iniquity did not overtake them. You might remember uh, from last time, Gibeah had been mentioned in chapter 9, verse 9, in reference to the scope of Israel's sin. Then the point is reemphasized here. Recall that in Judges 19 and 20, it recounts the story of uh, the, the Levite who had a concubine that was repeatedly raped one night and murdered in the city of Gibeah in the land of Benjamin. And as a result, civil war broke out, and it was a very terrible story. Um, they, they killed off. Well, anyway, it's, it's terrible what happened, but they got past that eventually because it sets up the scene for God to send a king, and eventually it takes us to Jesus, but it showed how bad it got within Israel before it got there. The point that God's making right here is that Israel had not improved since those days. They were just as sinful as they had ever been. They should have learned from past mistakes, but they didn't. Like a dog returning to vomit, so did Israel return to its sin. Not that we're all that much better, sad to say. Sometimes it seems we never learn. So praise God for Jesus' grace, because again, without him we'd have no hope. By the way, it is possible to break the cycle of repeated sin. How so? Once again, we fall upon the gospel of Christ. Because when we remain humbly dependent on him, we're ever mindful of his love towards us, his grace towards us, then we find that we're not even looking to the sin that once attracted us because the more we look to Jesus, the less we look to the lust of the flesh. So we look to Jesus. We're continually filled with the Spirit. And then we walk in freedom. Now Israel had not done this. And that's what God was pointing out in their comparison with Gibeah. They kept going after their sin. They stayed in that place. And thus God's judgment is certain to fall. We see in verse 10, When it is my desire... I will chasten them. People shall be gathered against them when I bind them for their two transgressions. Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain, but I harnessed her fair neck. I will make Ephraim pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his clods. Now, verse 10 can be a little bit misleading here when it says his desire. It wasn't God's desire to chasten or punish his people. His desire was their repentance. We'll see that in the very next verse, verse 12. The idea here is that the timing of Israel's judgment wasn't up to Israel. It was up to God. 
He would punish them when and how he saw fit to do so. God disciplines in his time and his way. It's only his mercy that was giving them plenty of warning and plenty of opportunity to repent. So he tells them this is coming, but I'll do it as I please. I'll do it as I desire. And God even tells Israel how they would be judged, and their judgment would come in the form of slavery. Uh, the picture here is like you know, a livestock that used to roam freely. Now it's going to be harnessed. And you notice, once again, we get a little side swipe at Judah, a little mention of the southern kingdom as well. Both Judah and Israel would be harnessed, would be bound, would be put on the bonds of slavery. They would be forced to serve. They would be pulling a plow. So both these nations are forced into slavery, though at different times, different empires, but it would happen, no doubt. Again, it brings up a point from last week. Sin leads to slavery. Israel, again, this is something they would learn firsthand. But this was not God's desire for them. His desire was for their repentance. We see it in verse 12. So for yourselves, righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. If the principle of sowing and reaping is true, and it is, then what we sow obviously makes a huge difference in what we reap. Now, Israel had chosen their sowing very poorly in the past, as makes clear in verse 13. We've seen it already. But this right here is what they should have done all along. They could have sown righteousness. They could have obeyed the Lord, cared for the orphan and the widow. They could have served the Lord in truth and sincerity. They could have worshipped him in Jerusalem. They could have done all these things according to the law as they were supposed to have done. And if they had, they would have reaped mercy, loving kindness, the loyal love of God. And this word for mercy is that same word of chesed that we've seen many times before. That covenant love that God had for them, that's what they would have experienced. They took themselves out of that because they were sowing the wrong things. But if they sown righteousness, if they'd sown the things of God, they would have reaped the benefits of God. That's what they could have done. What did they need to do? It. They needed, first of all, brokenness. They needed humility. Break up your fallow ground. Fallow ground is ground that needs to be tilled. Ground needs to be broken up in order to plant. <laughs> if you ever come to my front yard, which I hope you don't do for gardening purposes, because my parents used to do this, and it's just an ethanol and futility. But trying to plant any sort of grass seed, it's so hard, that ground is so hard, you've got to get in there and really break up the ground to get any seed to stay there. It's just the, too many pine trees, too much sand. Anyway, it's just ground needs to be broken. You've got to have some place for the seed to go. Break up the fallow ground. That's what happens to our hearts. Our hearts get so hard, there's no place for the seed of God's word to go. Israel needed to be uh, broken. That's what they need to do on themselves. Their hearts have become hard. They were unable to receive the instruction of God. Remember how Jesus spoke of the various types of soils in his parable, Matthew 13, the parable of the sowers, what it's often called. It's really the parable of the soils. And the good soil was the soil that was broken and ready to receive the seed of the word. They weren't doing that. So their hearts needed to be Broken, first of all, broken. Secondly, they needed a desire to seek the Lord. And really, this goes hand in hand with the first, because a person who softens his or her heart to the Lord is someone who's ready to seek the Lord. But let me say that this still takes intention, because a person can humble him or herself from pride, step away from pride, step away from self, and still never actually seek the Lord. I can be humble. There's a lot of humble atheists out there, but they're not seeking the Lord. Now, notice that the reverse is never true. You can't be proud and then seek the Lord. That never happens. But you can humble yourself and do nothing, but that's not what we're called to do. You're not called to humble yourself and do nothing as if, oh, okay, I've emptied my mind, now I'm not going to fill it up with anything else. No, we humble ourselves and then seek God. You humble yourself in order to seek Jesus. You won't find God in pride because God resists the pride, but he gives grace to the humble. And that's when we find the Lord. He rewards those who diligently seek him. And what would be the result if they did? Well, God says he would rain righteousness down upon them. What were they supposed to sow? They were supposed to sow righteousness. What would they receive? They would receive righteousness. God would give it to them in abundance. They would live as the righteous people of God, glorifying the righteous God, being in a right relationship with him. This is what God desired for them. This is what he wanted them. All they needed was to humble themselves in 
repentance. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? It's simple, but it's not easy. It's not easy because of the stubbornness of our heart. So our hearts need to be broken. Let me suggest to you that there's two ways that your hearts can be broken. You can break it yourself or you can have it broken for you. It's far better for you to humble yourself. They didn't do this. What they did was sow something else, which it goes on to say in verses 13 through 15. You have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You've eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way and the multitude of your mighty men. Therefore, tumult shall arise among your people and all your fortresses shall be plundered as shalmen plundered Beth Arbel on the day of battle, a mother dashed in pieces upon her children. So they sowed sin, they reaped judgment. They lied to themselves, they lied to others. They trusted themselves instead of their God. Their hope was in the multitude of mighty, mighty men rather than the power of the almighty God. And so their downfall comes from the same place, right? Their downfall, and they trust in their mighty men, so their downfall comes through mighty men. Armies would invade the land. They would be lost, experiencing terrible physical destruction within the land. We don't know everything about Shalman. We don't know everything about Beth Arbel. But apparently these were battles that were well known to the people at the time, and it spoke to them of destruction. That is exactly what they would face. Verse 15, Thus it shall be done to you, O Bethel, because of your great wickedness. At dawn the king of Israel shall be cut off utterly. Why had it come? They brought the judgment on themselves. God says, because of your great wickedness. From this reason, because of this wickedness, your sin. Now question. We've seen a lot of this, and especially as driven home here in chapter 10, is this all a big, I told you so from God? No. Considering the judgment that's about to fall on Israel, it's only right for God to tell them not only what they would experience, but why they would experience it. Because the accused has the right to know the crime of which he's accused. So Israel needed to know the reason for their judgment. But again, remember it didn't have to be this way. These were consequences, but God had so much more for them. And that's what chapter 11 goes on to emphasize. Starts talking about his past love, which was unreturned, unrequited. Verse 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. Now this statement actually has two fulfillments. The first fulfillment is Israel. At the Passover, when God sent Moses to bring Israel out of Egyptian slavery, it was as God himself was calling his lost son back home out of Egypt, I call my son. They went in there uh, during the, the, the years of the, the, the patriarchs, but they came out as a great nation. God called his son to give him the inheritance in the land. That's fulfillment number one. Fulfillment number two, we might remember what that came. That came with Jesus after his birth. This is specifically told us in Scripture, by the way, Matthew 2, 14 and 15, talking about that time that Joseph took the holy family into Egypt. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night, departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I call my son. You say, well, that sounds great, but how exactly does Jesus fulfill the prophecy? Well, this is how, because Jesus is the better than Israel. Jesus, in many ways, is to God what Israel ought to always have been. Jesus is the obedient one, the worshiping one, the praying one, the humble one. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the covenants that were made to Abraham, to Moses, and to David. All the promises of God we know are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So many of the prophecies of the nation find their ultimate fulfillment in Christ. And you say, well, I have these two fulfillments. Which one is correct? Well, both are. Understand that it's not uncommon for prophecies to have a dual fulfillment. We can't always determine this in advance. It's uh, pretty tough to just make this a blanket statement for every prophecy in the Bible, but hindsight generally makes it perfectly clear, and our best guide always is Scripture. When the Bible shows us clear dual fulfillment, like Jesus being called a son of David and uh, Solomon being the son of David, like Jesus and Israel called out of Egypt here, when the Bible shows it, then we're on very safe ground. Now that all said, we don't want to miss the forest for the trees. What's it saying here? This is an amazing love that God has for his people out of Egypt. I call my son. Earlier in Hosea, God used language to refer to Israel like a husband to a wife. Here's the language of a father to the son, just like he does with us, right? We're the bride of Christ, but we're also the children of God. God loved his son. He called his son out of Egypt. The Lord God did not at this point see Israel as his slave, though they certainly were. They were the servants of God. 
didn't just see Israel as a friend, though they were, he called Abraham and Moses his friend. God saw Israel as a son, just like he sees us through Christ as sons. We've been given the spirit of adoption to where we can call God our Abba, Father, Romans 8, 15. We've been given the right to be called the children of God, John 1, 12. We've been made joint heirs with Jesus because we're true sons and daughters of God. He loves us and he loves his children for so we are. Great love given by God towards Israel. Well, how was it returned to God? Well, it wasn't, verse 2. As they called them, so they went from them, they sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. This is how Israel repaid God. He gave them everything. They gave them nothing but idolatry. He taught them how to worship, and they sacrificed to the Baals. He gave them a temple where they could even burn incense, and they chose to offer their incense to carved images. Have you ever had a gift that was so despised by the recipient that it was like as they spit in your face as they turned away from it? That was the case of God and Israel. Be careful, it's not the same with you and me. We want to treasure the grace that's been given us. Value it, worship him in spirit and truth. Pray with thanksgiving, praying only, giving glory to God. Verse three, I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love, and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. It's such compassion, such personal interaction that the Hebrew actually emphasizes God's personal work here. You could translate this, I myself taught Ephraim. He inserts himself there. See, he doesn't outsource it to an angel. He gets personally involved. And again, this is the love of God in action on behalf of his people. The language is so amazing. Such gentleness, there's love, there's compassion. And no matter if the picture is like it has been, like a father to a son, or here as it transitions a bit, a gentle farmer to his beloved livestock, God cared for his people in wonderful ways. This is all unknown by Israel. They knew it, but they chose not to see it. They ignored it. They purposed to put it out of their sight. We see it here, the the apostasy that comes, verse 5. He shall not return to the land of Egypt, but the Assyrian shall be his king because they refuse to repent. And the sword shall slash his cities, devour his districts, and consume them because of their counsels. And we recall that Israel has come up several times in the book of Hosea. It's generally been a picture of slavery. It's the same thing here. It's specified here. And it's specified as a picture because Israel was about to go once more into bondage, but not to Egypt, specifically to Assyria. Why? Because they refused to repent. They had the invitation to humble themselves, to break up their fallow ground, their hearts, to seek God, but they didn't do it. They refused to do it. Not a misunderstanding, not a lack of awareness that they needed to do this. It was an outright refusal to turn towards their God and King. They didn't want the Lord, so they'd receive a different ruler, one who would not love them the way that God had done. See, they conspired among themselves. They thought this would be best, but their own counsel backfired. They thought they knew better than God, and they found out differently. Plans of men are always inferior to the plans of God. Verse 7, My people are bent on backsliding from me. Though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt them. To say that they're bent on backsliding is to say that they were hung up on apostasy. It emphasizes their refusal. They were bound and determined to sin against God, to reject him, to turn away from him. They might call upon him with their lips as the most high, but God knew the state of their hearts. They did not really intend to exalt him. They wanted to turn away from him. They intended, determined to turn the other direction. You ever know somebody like this who's so bound and determined not to go to God? You ever been someone like this, bound and determined to run away from God? And running away from God never solves anything. Never. And you got to wonder, why do we do it so often? Well, fear, shame, sheer willfulness. We want our ways to be the best way, but they never are. Again, what we need is humility. Simple submission to God. Trusting Him. We find our Father knows best. And again, all this judgment, all this consequence, this wasn't what God wanted. He didn't want them running away. He wanted them running to Him. He loved them. He wanted the best for them. We see this present love in verse 8. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zoboam? 
My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. So incredible, compassionate, tore God up to think of his people's destruction. Now they deserve the full onslaught of God's wrath against them. They deserve to be wiped off the face of the earth like the ancient cities of Adma, Zeboiim, cities like Sodom and Gomorrah, all mentioned usually at the same time, cities that were erased from history that were totally wiped out by God because of their sin. That's what Israel deserved, but God says he didn't want to do it. His heart is, you know, poetically speaking here in his language, his heart was turning over in his chest, doing flip-flops. He was stirred up in sympathies for his beloved people. They deserved infinite judgment. God desired to show them mercy. That's his desire with us. That's where we get the gospel of Christ. What we deserve is destruction and eternity filled with nothing but the torments of hell. We deserve eon upon eon of regret, pain, sorrow for all the ways we sinned against the God who loved us and created us, gave us life. But God didn't want that for us. And his heart was churned for us, turned over for us. His sympathy was stirred for us. That's why he sent Jesus. He doesn't want us handed over to sin and death. He wants to receive us for life and eternity. Praise God, we can, right? So that's God's present love. goes on to talk about God's future love in verse 9 through 11. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. And I will not come with terror. Now at first glance, it would seem that if you know, God had turned from his judgment of Israel... And so is Assyria shouldn't come. But we know from history, Assyria did indeed invade the land, conquer the northern kingdom. So how can God's promise of mercy be true? Because this is a future promise of his Israel. Even here, there, there is an element of this that's true in the present day for Israel at that time. In a sense, God did not execute the full fierceness of his anger. Not totally. If he had, Israel would not have been enslaved by Assyria. They would have been wiped out, destroyed by Assyria. God allowed other nations to be wiped out from history. How many Hittites have you met lately? God allowed other nations to be destroyed. He could have done the same thing with Israel, but he didn't. He judged them in his wrath, but he didn't let the fullness of it fall upon them. But even more than that, it's evident that this is a future promise from the second line. I will not again destroy Ephraim. He would not turn back to do the same thing again to them in the future. What was accomplished, what was accomplished. No more was necessary. How, though, could Israel be certain of this promise? Because God says, I'm the one who makes it. God isn't a man. Praise God. Jesus is a man, yes, incarnate, but when he's talking about it, not a man, he doesn't have the nature of man here. He's not double-minded like us. He's not deceitful like us. Not a man that he should repent. He doesn't lie. He doesn't turn away from his purpose. Hallelujah that he doesn't do that. He's the Holy One. And though they needed to fear him and worship, they didn't need to fear that he would come and terrorize them with judgment. God promised to show them mercy in the future. And how would Israel react to that future day? Well, they'll follow him. Look at verse 10. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. And when he roars, then his son shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria. And I will let them dwell in their houses, says the Lord. Usually when lions roar, things run away. Here, God roars, and that's a sign for his children to return, to come back from slavery, and they come back from every corner of the world to the land of Israel. They're dwelling in those houses. Of course, some of this can be seen today in fulfillment when there is a restored land of Israel, the nation of Israel. And they haven't quite come all the way here. We're praying for the day that they see Jesus in faith as Messiah. But we see some of this coming true. God's word always does. Verse 12 says this, just briefly, Ephraim has encircled me with lies. The house of Israel with deceit. Judah still walks with God, even the Holy One who's faithful. We won't go over this right now because it's actually included with the first verse of chapter 12 in the Hebrew texts. Actually included with that in the, uh, uh, the Septuagint as well. Um, English translations follow the Latin Vulgate on this. I'm not really sure the reason why. But when we stop at this point... <laughs> We're stopping with the love of God. And the love of God that he had for Israel was amazing. Just imagine if they hadn't rejected him to go seeking after idols. They hadn't chosen to live in a rebellion and sin. They had what? An open invitation to come back. 
repentance, humility. They had that invitation, but God wasn't going to make that choice for them. They needed to do it themselves. Otherwise, there's consequences. Reaping the things they'd sown. Now, we know those words are written for Israel, but they're not just preserved for Israel. They're written and preserved for us. So we can learn from their mistakes. Be careful, guys, that you don't try to force God into a second place. Be careful that we don't start trying to engage in buffet-style worship, making a, a little religion of my own making. How many times have we seen people do this? Well, my God would do that. My God wouldn't do that. I know what that's what the Bible says, but this is what I believe. That's buffet worship. Most of all, we don't want to fight against the love of God. He's done so much for us. We've got to open our eyes to see it. He's cared for us, provided for us, showered us with compassion through the Lord Jesus. So we love him, we worship him, we serve him, we know him. Where your heart has been hardened, ask for God's help in breaking it, softening it. Humble yourself, seek the Lord in his kingdom, because if that's what we're sowing, just imagine the harvest that we will receive. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the love and compassion that you have shown us, demonstrated for us through Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to face judgment. Thank you, Lord, that we can live as sons and daughters of the Most High God. That's what you desire for us. I pray that you would help us walk in humility. I pray that you would help us walk with our eyes on our Lord Jesus, not seeking other things and making up other ideas of you, but seeking you and your truth and faith. Fill us with your spirit, Lord, as we would continue on through this week, even as we continue and worship you tonight. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.